Hello, my name is Oliver and welcome to my workshop. If you've never been on this channel before and you've never seen one of these videos before, this is Pandora, my Cox GTM. Now then, what is a Cox GTM? It's a small, mid-engined, mini-based rally race car that was made from the 60s all the way through to the 90s. Now, I fell in love with them as a small child and then as a 30-year-old man, I found one rotting in a side yard in Normandy. I'm now six foot six and couldn't fit in it because this car is the size of a shoe. So I bought it anyway and it has been my mission to completely rebuild it because the car was crashed, burnt and rusted to death. The original floor pan was completely unusable and far too small for me to fit in. So I'm making a new one with an integrated roll cage no less, but not just that, one that I actually fit in. So I've made myself 100 millimeters or five inches more legroom, two inches more uh, more foot well space and enough headroom for me to sit sit in the car with a helmet and fit which even normal sized human beings can't do in a GTM. Not only that I fit Honda suspension at the back or I'm in the process of fitting Honda suspension at the back and Mazda MX-5 suspension at the front and converting the car to left hand drive as well as fitting a 250 plus horsepower Honda Integra Type R engine. All fitting in the original foot footprint of the car. So it's not bigger on the outside, but it is bigger on the inside, as well as being literally 100% more powerful. So as mad as it might sound, the first job I have to do is cut this piece off. And the reason for that is the rear stays of the roll cage have to come through the back window. Now, I'd be doing this job whether the roll bar came up around here or not, unfortunately. Now, the good news is that we will actually be reusing this so it won't be going away and it won't be going in a bin. It just has to be moved for the moment. And uh, never fear, because it'll all work out, don't worry. <laughs> Don't worry about this bit because it's going to get made pretty and sorted out and then stuck back on here when it, time, when it comes time to uh, put a back window in the car. We can now fit the body which is the good news and this is really exciting for me because it's my first time seeing the body on with the rear stays in place. This is exactly how I hoped it would be. Usually when people put a roll cage in a GTM you get these big stairs that stick right out, but we've managed to fit them right in so they're hardly visible. They're very visible for the back, but we have a plan for that. That is excellent news. And it's one of the reasons why we brought the roll bar out, as well as getting it away from my head. It allows the roll cage to fit much tighter and much neater. The reason that we had to fit the body is because I had to mock all of this up. I bet you'd forgotten we made these panels, didn't you? In a previous video, we made these side panels way back when it was like the third or fourth video, along with this front bulkhead. And I had to mock it up to see how it now fits with the new upper door bar. And it fits really well. We need to put a bend in at the top here, and obviously a bend in at the bottom here, because this panel needs to meet this tube. And then we need to make a lower chassis rail, and then we can make our outside sill and our car can actually look like a car. Now I've had to mock up the other side because on the chassis that we have, the original floor pan, it's so badly damaged that this bend is completely indistinguishable. It's completely bent over and, and shot at. So this one will be this side, the driver's side. And then from the driver's side, I'll make the passenger side. That's been half the trouble with this car, 
because of the accident damage, all my dimensions are just completely out of whack of the original floor pan. And then on top of that, I've got Honda rear suspension and no Honda to measure. And I've got MX-5 front suspension and no MX-5 to measure. If I'd started with a parts car, then I'd have all my measurements all laid out. And I'd know where everything was going and where everything had to go. But, unfortunately, it's like building a car in fresh air. Which is why I don't have a big jig or anything like that. Because there's nothing to make a jig off, basically. Basically, it is what it is. So I've just got to work it all out and do a lot of maths and a lot of uh, a lot of figuring stuff out and a lot of like using the one uncraft bit and working from there. How much an angle is it? Not a lot. We'll try that. It's not far. Maybe that? Anytime you're frustrated because you don't have the right tool, or you don't have the money, or you don't have the workshop, just remember a Toro Bugatti built Grand Prix cars in a stable block without electricity. He figured out how to do it with no formal engineering education whatsoever. So if he did it, we should be able to do it, shouldn't we? I'm not saying I'm a Tory Bugatti, but where there's a will, there's a way. We've got welders and stuff. They had to do basically fancy soldering with uh, gas axes and... Uh, right, I need to get my angle right. people see pre-war cars as like caveman cars like they're so basic and simple some of them don't even you know racing cars without a floor incredibly dangerous cars. but one of the reasons why i love them is the ingenuity and the stories behind them people who were bicycle mechanics and <laughs> a lot of bicycle mechanics where's my spanner gone and stuff in sheds and barns and stable blocks and any workspace that they possibly could, you know, kitchen tables, making engines and pistons and everything from scratch because there was no summit racing, there was no demon tweaks, you couldn't just, you know, look stuff up in a catalogue and order some coil overs, no. If you wanted leaf springs, you had to make leaf springs. If somebody wanted high compression pistons, somebody had to make high compression pistons. If someone wanted to make something better, they had to. It's one of the why, one of the reasons why one of the coolest racing series in history, and one that gets absolutely no love at all, and should do. There should be massive documentaries about it. Is the 750 Club Formula Set or Formula 750, as it's known, 
which is a formula series in the UK that does uh, basically they started off with like Austin 7 engines and um, then they went to Reliant engines and stuff like that but they're all home built cars made in people's sheds and people's like allotments and stuff and Gordon Murray started his, his main career there Colin Chapman started there like some of the greatest minds in Formula 1 started there the people you know such so much talent in such a small group and some of the coolest cars ever if you want to go down an internet rabbit hole look up Formula 750 cars because they are seriously awesome right I'm on this one now so I need to reach that angle One of the things nobody ever tells you about monocoque design and monocoque construction is how loud it is. I love tubes. Tubes are really quiet. But every time you do anything with a monocoque, it does that. And it takes a lot of effort not to make a car that vibrates like absolute crazy. It's one of the reasons for dimple dyeing panels. A lot of people think that it's for strength. But one of the reasons to put a dimple dye in the centre of a panel is actually to stop it vibrating because it lowers its vibrational frequency and much like anything um, whether it be a bridge or a car or a bicycle everything has a vibrational frequency and when you make it nice and low it makes it nice and quiet but if you've ever ridden in a Land Rover with no, win with no windows in it, so like a Land Rover van or something like that, or in the back of a van with no windows, it's so loud. And the reason is, you've got all these big panels and they all go together. Boats do it a lot. And when you, when you sail a boat, when you sail like a big motor yacht and you've got two engines, you have to offset the throttles on them so that the vibrational frequencies of both engines don't run into each other otherwise the whole boat goes you have to offset them just by a couple of hundred rpm and uh, then the whole boat just two tools along and it's like half the half the noise because the vibrational frequency is different but cars are a lot like that as well you have to watch that frequency All right are these the same moment of truth if not i'll have to, I'll have to tweak them ignore that hammer <laughs> they won't stack against each other but we will then meet are they the same i dare say they're the same i tell you i could have been an engineer This one goes in. That one goes in this way. That one goes in this way. By the way, if you'd like to support this uh, this build, a lot of people email me and ask me if they can give me money, they ask if they can like, help get me parts, all sorts, to get loads of lovely offers from some really, really nice people. And I always say the same thing, the nicest thing you can do and the best thing you can do to help this car be built is to share these videos with your friends. That goes for any small YouTuber out there, by the way, not just me. I'm not just making this a self promotion. I want to say anybody making something beautiful and something cool, share their videos because it can change somebody's life. You might not think that you sharing a simple video onto Facebook or onto Twitter or whatever, or even just telling your friends about it. You might not think that that's a big deal, but if five people do it, if five people that watch this video out of the 
thousands of people that will. If five people watch this video, they share it with five people, and then they share that video with, with five people again, within like 14 revolutions, I think mathematically, that's everybody on the planet. <laughs> so you can really change someone's life by sharing videos with friends, not just of this channel, but of every channel that you like. And uh, change some people's lives and make the, make the content creators' lives that you watch and that you enjoy and who spend so much time making stuff for you for free, make their lives better by sharing videos on YouTube. It, uh, it really helps. Can you help me clamp this up please? I've made my panels fit and then I've removed them because the clamps were getting in the way for the next job. The other thing that I've done to prepare for the next job is make this little suspension jig. Now, in a perfect world, I would have made a really big suspension jig that holds everything perfectly in place, but because we're making chassis legs, I want something that's really unintrusive and that I can keep in place and not kind of have to work around and, and mess around. But this little brace, basically it's reversible, so it works for this side and that side, and it holds the suspension roughly in the right place. Obviously, we're gonna have some adjustability in there as well, but um, it holds it good enough in place so that we can get everything where we need it to be. And I've drawn out my front suspension geometry and I've stuck it to the board over that. That's what that is, if you're wondering. Now, the geometry that we're using is obviously we're using NA, NB, or Mark 1 and Mark 2 MX5 front suspension. It's the same suspension for both cars, but it has different geometry. The um, the NB used what was called an improved geometry, basically maximized for bigger wheels because the NA used these little tiny 14 inch wheels. And because we are not going to be using big wheels, we're going to be using small wheels, we don't want the later NB geometry. So we're using NA geometry and I've refined it a little bit. I've, um, the way that I've refined it is we've added a little bit caster and we've pulled out a bunch of the anti-squat. Now, oh sorry, anti-dive. Now what anti-dive is, if you're unfamiliar, obviously you're familiar with camber and caster because I've made a video about it in the past. There's a link to it there or there or wherever. Right, anti-squat and anti-dive. Anti-squat is at the rear and anti-dive is at the front. Basically, dive is when you press on the brakes and the front of the car goes and anti-squat is when you accelerate hard and the car goes right. Now in a perfect world, the way suspension would work is when you went over big bumps, your wheelbase would actually get longer. It's easiest to explain with the back end. This is why um, trailing arms work really well for a lot of cars, because as you go over bumps, your wheelbase actually grows, and that makes a small and short car feel really stable. And that's a really good thing. And your wheelbase at the front would actually get longer by coming forward. The problem with that is it makes your car handle like a 2CV. And as you know, a 2CV has leading arms at the front and trailing arms at the back. So when you go around corners, it has a lot of lean and wallow. And when you accelerate, it does this. And when you brake, it does that. And you get a lot of weight transfer, which is kind of undesirable. So the way that car companies get around that is by doing the opposite. And they make the wheelbase so it actually shortens over bumps. So they, instead of it going, getting longer and going that way, it actually comes this way. And that's okay on a really heavy car. Things like Mer and Mercedes and BMWs, big saloon cars, have a lot of anti-dive and a lot of anti-squat. And the MX-5, because it has the engine quite high in front of the, in relation to the suspension, has quite a bit of anti-dive. Not tons by any, by any standard but far more than we need because we are 390 kilos lighter than MX-5. A lot of our weight is in the back and our weight is much lower compared to almost any other car. Even the, uh, the driver and the passenger are much lower down in the car so most of the weight is actually kind of in this location, it's not up here. So that when we brake we're not going to get that weight transferred down onto the suspension. So we've pulled out a bunch of the anti-dive. We have a little bit, not, but not tons. And the, the reason, uh, the advantage to not having a load of anti-squat or anti-dive, like I said, is a more stable feeling car. It's a less twitchy feeling car. 
It's a very predictable handling characteristic, but not only that, it gives you loads of mechanical grips. One of the things that makes a 2CV so grippy is that that beautifully predictable handling characteristic and the fact that it doesn't have any anti-dive. So, in fact, it's got, if, if anything, it's got pro-dive. <laughs> so, yeah, we've pulled out a bunch of anti-squats and we have tweaked the geometry for a much, much lighter car. Because, like I say, we're, whatever, 390 kilos lighter. So, we don't need it. So, we might as well have the added grip because the more grip this car can have, the less twitchy it's going to feel, the less pointy it's going to feel and the better it's going to handle and that's that's the aim of the game so we're in a really good position to now make the bottom chassis bar bottom chassis bar bottom chassis leg whatever you want to call it call it that but yeah everything's held in place and now what we have to do is make a cardboard template There we have it, two lower chassis rails. Now I'm not gonna notch them now, I'll notch them off camera. And the reason I'll do that is because my next job is the really exciting one for me, and that is the outer sill. We're finally going to be making this bit. So it's gonna be slightly different to the GTM of old, but um, it's going to be the same, but different. This is a perfect example of what looks right on paper doesn't always look right in the metal. And we have three different forms here that we've tested in order to make our different radiuses. We have some 40mm tube, we have a good old acro, and we have a piece of PVC pipe. And uh, this one is the roll cage tubing, this one is the acro, and this one is the PVC pipe. And what we're testing here is the radius around the bottom edge, not the top. And I think we have a winner. We've spent the last 25 minutes, half an hour, just walking around and looking. Because once we start doing this, that's it. And I think our winner is the Acro. I think this one has come out the best. And now what we'll do is we'll put a, a bend along the top edge and see how it actually sits. I think this one looks a little bit bulbous and looks really good on the back, but when you put it on the front, it looks a bit thick. And um, this one looks really tight and pulled in. At the front, it looks fantastic. But when you put it on the back, it looks a bit too tight. And uh, once this car has wheel arches on, I, I think it'll look a bit anorexic. So I think this is just right. Curse my perfectionism. This, of course, is the original GTM sill. And if you put a spirit level against it, or a straight edge, you'll notice that it is pan flat along here and has a large radius in the bottom. It's exactly the same as this one here. It's an exact reproduction of it. And this one was our third place last time. It looked really good on the back, but at the front it just looked too bulbous. And then I thought to myself, well, what if we put a slight curve in these two panels? In this one was number two, and this one was our favorite. Because there isn't a single straight panel on this car. Every panel is curved one way and curved the other, but yet the sills are perfectly flat. And I've changed my mind. This one is now my favorite. This is the roll cage tubing with a slight curve in it. You can just see the slight curve. And it's not much, but it just shows that it just looks right. It just, it looks like it's supposed to be there. It looks like it's always been there. That slight perfect, that, it's just spot on. Unfortunately, this one is by far the hardest to make. It's, uh, <laughs> it's the hardest one to bend around. The roll cage tubing is very difficult to bend the steel around and it's the hardest to put a, a radius in. And because of that, I don't have time this week to make the inner cells, because I want them to be perfect. You know, they, they are one of the things that is the first thing that you see when you see this car. It's such a low car, it's such a small car. 
and so they have to be just right. And even though it's not true to the original floor pan, I have to think that if the uh, if the ladies and gentlemen at GTM had have had a little bit more time, that this is what they would have come up with. You know, if you do, when you talk to car designers, if they always say, "If I'd have had a bit more time, if I if I'd have had a bit more money, I would have done things slightly different." And I think this is everything that a GTM could be. And I think that's what Pandora is. Pandora is not just a GTM, but she is everything that a GTM could be. You know, an evolution taken taken to eleven, as it were. And uh, I, if I go with the easiest thing to make and not the best thing, then I'm selling a short, aren't I? So if you disagree with me, tell me down there in the comment section below. Tell me which one of these is your favourite still. Do you believe that I should have gone? With the uh, with the original style Cox GTM inner sill, or do you think my improved inner sill will look better? If you want to support this channel, the best way to do it is by clicking like, subscribing, giving me a comment, and sharing these videos with your friends. I always read every single one of your comments, and if you'd like to watch more videos after this one, um, after you've clicked on my face to subscribe, there's a Pandora playlist with every single Pandora video in there and a random video that I haven't chosen yet there. Please be awesome to each other and I'll see you all in the next video. Bye bye.